Hi. Oh, perfect. So um, thank you for coming and welcome to the tie that binds unique cyber tools in the payments industry. Um, I'm going to hand you over to Norma, our moderator for today, to do introductions. Thank you, uh, Norma. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. This is a full house for 940 in the morning. How are we doing? All right, that was a little weak. One more time. How are we doing? That's what I am looking for. OK. All right, my name is Norma Krayam. I am the director of the ATPC Cyber Council. I'm also the chair of the Cyber Privacy and Digital Innovation Practice at Vanskoik Associates. And we are going to kick off the best, the most amazing, and the most interesting panel you're going to have all day long. Um, one of the things, um, this is not a joke. One of the things I think that is important, and we are going to spend some time on, time on uh, I was going to make a joke about the tie that binds, is really the critical importance of the payment processing industry. For all of us on this stage who do this every day, and I'm going to do some intros in a minute, these are the people who make sure that everything happens the way that it should safely and securely. I think when people focus on the industry in general, they think of banking and they think of financial services. This is the part of the industry that is what we call the payment rails or that connective tissue that keeps everything going. And before I start, I'm going to explain just a little bit of as to what the ATPC is, and then I'm going to introduce our panel, and we're going to go rapid fire through a number of issues. So first, the ATPC is the American Transaction Processors Coalition. We have our executive director in the back. He's walking around, Wes Richards. And what's terrific about this organization is it was created in 2014 to really focus on the needs of the payment processing industry. And a little known fact, I think it's 70% to 80% of all the payment processors are based in Georgia. And so we call it Transaction Alley. Now over time as this organization came forward, cybersecurity was always an important issue. Uh, but it was in 2020 when Wes said to me, Norma, we want to create something that is solid and enduring to focus on cybersecurity issues. And we created a cybersecurity council that is really only in, r focused on those operational impacts. We have chief information security officers, CIOs, chief security officers, and what we have created on this panel is really a very tight-knit group that actually works together no matter the fact that they work in different companies to better secure our future together. So what I'm going to do today is do a quick down the, the panel, let folks talk a little bit about themselves, and then we're going to run into questions. So we're going to start with Rick, who's the chairman of our ATPC Cyber Council and is at Fiserv. And then we're going to Clarissa, who is the CISO at Deluxe. And last but not least, we're going to go to Subra, who is the CISO at Visa. So actually, Rick, why don't we start with you, just okay. a little bit about yourself and your priorities. Sure. Hi, Rick Van Lubender at Fiserv. Um, I run all of our cybersecurity in the international regions, plus do uh, what we call our client trust function. So we meet with clients and talk about our program and what we do. Fiserv processes, on average, about 12,000 transactions per second all year long. Um, so we've got quite a bit of activity that's happening, and many of our contracts have a decision within 200 milliseconds from the time you dip your card or tap your card to make that smooth checkout happen when you're paying things at a, a merchant. Uh, as such, we're, we're an interesting target for some of the bad actors out there, so we've got a lot of work that we do to protect that infrastructure. Excellent. Clarissa? Good morning. Um, I'm Clarissa Banks. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Deluxe. Um, similar to Rick, uh, our focus is primarily on protecting um, our customer data, our company, um, and making sure that we're also continuously uh, contributing to the security community as well. I've had over 25 years of cybersecurity um, experience. I like to say I started when the only entity that care about cybersecurity was the government. Um, so it's been a, a long and, and fun journey. Um, so for Deluxe, I don't know if you guys um, are aware, but we annually process over $3 trillion, um, in, in volume. So that's significant. That's 15% of the U.S. GDP, just to kind of give you some context there. Good morning. Um, great to see you all. I'm Subra Kumarswamy. I'm the CSO for Visa. Um, you know, along with my colleagues here, you know, we are here to help you uh, to be safe and secure in a payment e ecosystem. 
uh, you know, just to kind of little, get a little bit of uh, background on the company itself, I'm sure many of you are using Visa, so thank you for that. Um, you know, we, on an annual basis, we do about $15 trillion. Uh, we are critical infrastructure for US. Uh, by the time this session is done, we have probably done about 15 billion in transactions. Uh, so it's a very, very uh, critical uh, part of the payment ecosystem. Uh, the other important aspect is we are over, we are globally, we are footprinted on 200 plus countries. Uh, you know, we have been, um, you know, seen as a critical infrastructure, just not for US, but for the entire globe. So great to be here with the team and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Excellent, thank you. You know, one of the things that is terrific about working with this team, and, and we have many others who participate with us uh, that aren't here today, but it covers all the card brands, the payment processors, we have a number of banks, we have cards that are banks, right? The intricacies of what we do is really important. And when we focus uh, within the Cyber Council, we really focus on two main things. The first main thing is this peer-to-peer -peer partnership. Right, bringing together the people who are running the businesses on the cyber side every single day to help fix problems. And then the second piece is very selective, that external focus. And when the Congress or the US government or governments around the world are starting to say, we need more regulations, we need more information, we're gonna mandate you report these things, the, the voices of those who are up here with me today in our Cyber Council are so critical because they know what can work and what can't. And so we have found over the last four years that we've been together that people have been able to solve a lot of problems. And I think that's what we really want, right? We want more of that private to private collaboration. Now, Subra and the team mentioned one issue that's really important for us to talk about, and that is this industry is part of critical infrastructure. It is part of essential services in the European Union. It is part of like every new term you can possibly come up with. SIFI, systemically important financial institutions, or SIFMU, I think one of the things that I want to do just sort of as a lightning round is, is ask our folks every time the federal government says we need a new category and most likely we will be that thing, you know, how is it that people operationalize that? Because you can't turn the light switch and suddenly say I have like 12 new reporting regimes and I know what to do with them. So Rick, we're going to start with you and go on down. Yeah, so that is a challenge. Um, when you look at some of the agencies in the government that come out with other reporting requirements, uh, one of our focuses has really been harmonization of the regulatory requirements so that we can report to one entity in a, in a perfect world and have that spread throughout the government where it needs to go. Um, we've got 40,000 plus employees at Biosurf and there's a pretty significant portion of that dedicated to understanding the compliance obligations and what we need to do. And then after that, is this a reportable event or not? And there's quite a bit of deliberation that goes on before we, we report things up to the regulatory bodies. Yeah, Clarissa? I'll say in general, like a lot of the requirements <coughs> does have conflicts. And as part of cybersecurity, governance and, and compliance um, falls under our department. So a lot of that is really partnering with legal counsel from a exposure perspective, and then taking a look internally with your controls, your processes, um, and make sure it aligns. But yeah, to Rick's point, there's still a lot of administration mapping that needs to happen uh, in order to make sure that not only internally you comply, but you can articulate that externally as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, we always say that um, if you do security really well, compliance comes for free, right? You know, <laughs> uh, you know it's, it should be in the nature. We say that you know, cybersecurity should be in the DNA for every employee, for every one of our partners. Uh, I know there's a lot of requirements coming from, you know, from the government, from, you know, including some of our own uh, requirements like PCI, right? So it's very important to make sure ultimately the foundation is very strong across every one of the pillars. So we take from, we take a bottom-up approach, right, to ensure that we do invest heavily on the areas that matters that eventually will drive the, the requirements, uh, you know, in a proactive way. I think today, given the fact there are so many conflicting requirements, it puts a lot of companies in, a, in the back foot. Um, you know, even though a company may be doing well, uh, but from the point of responding and making it onerous, right, that's a big challenge for companies. Uh, so we always said security first is our, is our culture, uh, and then by, as a result, we can drive the compliance and other requirements without really sweating a lot. One of the things that's amazing too in the conversations that we have together is it's like obviously security, cybersecurity is 
number one. It's front and center. That also means that this team is integrating within their companies about new products and services. And so while we certainly hear that phrase secure by design, I would say this industry is, has done that many, many years before others. The other piece I think that's important is that speed to market doesn't mean security to market. And trying to make sure that we can balance out, and I know the, the Biden-Harris administration and the, the feds and other governments are trying to do this. But I, I'm gonna go off of that a little bit out of order for a minute. And I want everyone to talk about that integration between new products and services and security issues, cybersecurity, not just here in the United States, but because you're global companies. How do you manage those issues? So Rick, we'll go with you. So from a secure by design perspective, we've invested heavily over the last few years in a whole shift left approach. Um, we've got various tools to do dynamic testing, open source composition, and, and other testing of our applications that we put in our developers' hands. And as they're doing development and their iterative cycles, they test, they fix. We've integrated that in with a, a learning platform that if they're told they have this defect in their code but don't know how to fix it, they can go to a portal that will have a animated um, educational piece that shows them what the vulnerability is, how to fix it in the language they're programming in. And we've got about 30 languages in that platform right now. And then once they get to a point where they've taken care of all that low hanging, easy to fix um, defects, they send it to our manual application security testing team, the penetration testers that we have on staff. So that's, that's how we work on the secure by design to ensure that we don't introduce code that has problems, can be exploited. And the manual team is really looking not only at the defects in the code, but the business logic as well. So if they can break that business logic, it gets sent back to be reworked. So clear, so you can go any direction you want in this one, you know, the integration internally between you and your new products team, we're gonna dig more into uh, supply chain security and SBOM and things, but you know, even maybe the governance issues internally. So um, similar to, to REC, and I'm sure similar to other um, industry as well, there's multiple faceted, right? First is making sure that we have training uh, awareness, right? And then we also have a pretty strong application and product security as well that does the testing, both pre-production as well as continuous monitoring and testing. Um, and then the, the other component of it um, as well is what I call the security advisory and consulting services that prior to even deployment or writing of code, um, and development of some of the testing environment, we work with the product team to make sure that the security design and patterns is accounted for at the beginning. So that, again, those patterns and, and principles are developed in the earlier stages so that at the end, it's not a roadblock and it's just a matter of validating some of those controls um, that we want to design into the product. So working with the technology team, the product team, uh, legal and compliance uh, tightly, just make sure that across the board all of those uh, security and data principles are applied at the beginning. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, just in the, in the interest of not being redundant, uh, the one thing I would say is that it's very important to have the culture, security culture, uh, you know, set at the top, right? So we always say the tone has to be set at the top, so we can percolate all the way down. Uh, so a couple of things, right? Uh, going back to what the, uh, my colleague said that, one is, you know, we use what we call a PNP, pessimistic and paranoid, <laughs> <laughs> right? That's our principles. Uh, how does it manifest? You know, we say that you cannot take applications to production if you don't meet our standards. That includes, you know, mitigating critical high, medium vulnerabilities, right? So we're not just, uh, you know, talking the talk, we had to walk the talk to ensure that we have a, a, a actual clearance, a checkbox by cyber before any application or any services, any APIs go live, right? Now, number one is to ensure that you know, there is a real, very clear accountability with the technology folks who are, who are responsible for delivering features and delighting the consumers. Number two is you know, holding the partners accountable, right? We always say that you're only as strong as the weakest link in the ecosystem. So we, as, we are, we are hyper-connected as a companies, as enterprises. We rely on APIs from vendors, rely on uh, technology from our, our partners. So we need to make sure that they are held accountable for their posture, right? And that's one of the security by design, because you can be really, you know, you, you may have the best uh, fortified cyber posture, but if you're relying on vendors and partners who don't have the same level of rigor and the pessimism, right, and, and the standard, you're gonna be asked, you know, you're gonna have a biggest link in the chain. 
So a lot of my, you know, my focus is to, you know, as we become a role model, right, ensuring that we have very strong posture internally, our, you know, we are making sure that third party and sometimes fourth parties to make sure that they are following the regular standard and they're not creating risk for visa. And I'm going to come full circle on that. One of the things I think it was really important that we heard from all three of you is that governance structure internally within companies has really been changing over the last, let's say, five, seven, ten years. You know, in the past, the, the cyber geniuses who are up here, you know, doing what they need to every day were doing their thing. But when we talked about new product development, right, other things, they tended to be more stovepipe. But uh, just seeing a pessimistic and paranoid, I, I, I belong to that club, um, that part's fine. And, and as we think about those issues, though, we're, let's dig into supply chain a little bit. And the, you know, really, the next few moments, we're going to talk about supply chain, we're going to talk about cloud, software bill of materials, and we're going to talk a little bit about AI and how those can be used on that offensive and defensive piece. But first on supply chain, right? Supply chains are very complicated, and in our industry, it's really a, a, a mix, obviously, of hardware, but a lot of software vendors around the world. And really making sure that you had vendors in a variety of locations was always important. And right after the Russia's invasion of the Ukraine, we had this conversation about supply chain, both where were vendors physically, as, uh, as long as, as long, I can't even talk today, in addition to how you're gonna secure those supply chains. So Rick, I'm gonna start with you and you can, you know, everybody tag off of that whichever way you want. Yeah, so we've got concerns about supply chain like everyone does. Um, on the software side, we've made it part of our template for our contracts with vendors that they have to provide SBOMs to us, the software bill of materials, so we can see how it's composed, what components it has. And then if there is a, an alert for a critical vulnerability or defect in that open source package, we can go to that vendor and get timelines for remediation. Um, from a supply chain perspective on our point of sale devices that we manufacture, we've bought several years worth of chips and have them in reserve, so we're not gonna see any, any um, mm -hmm. inavailability affect our ability to produce those, those point of sale devices. Um, each of the areas of our company, we've taken very proactive steps to manage the supply chain. Um, whether it's software or hardware or, or other services that are being provided to us. Clarissa? I would say similarly, it is a challenge. Um, and one of the things that we really focus on is the whole resiliency, right? And how the third party plays into that um, supply chain. The other thing I will say is with some of the very large um, third party um, cloud service provider and some of the challenges that's been reported in the past, I would say year and a half to two years. Um, not that it, it, it hasn't been top of mind, but it kind of highlights some of those resiliency and dependence, right? And, and kind of magnifies it. And now we're taking that and being more explicit and, and identifying those key third party suppliers and how integrated they are in our operations. Um, and taking a look um, again of is it a single source? Do we have multiple vendors? Just to again increase the resiliency um, around that. But part of this and part of the ATPC uh, mission is highlighting those challenges and driving some uh, additional um, oversight and contributions there. Yeah, similarly, uh, you know, when I look at the supply chain, uh, you know, you can broadly categorize that, you know, critical suppliers, suppliers, you know, you're really reliant on. And then there's very long tail, right? As you know, every company uses hundreds and hundreds of SaaS services, um, hundreds of thousands of open source components, right? Every one of your application has, you know, I'm sure, uh, you know, you're very familiar with that. And you cannot secure what you are not, what is not visible, right? The number one is to make sure that, you know, having visibility across the board. So we have very strong uh, focus on inventory management, uh, not just the application criticality and the resiliency part, but also every uh, third party vendors who are offering services, open source components. So having a very strong governance around it to ensure that you understand what are the dependencies, what applications are dependent on what third party vendors or what open source components is very important. Uh, and number two, right, uh, to ensure that you are not reacting all the time. So we have put a policy in place to ensure that anything that comes into our, our enterprise has to be scanned. Uh, in, you know, either uh, developers bring uh, applications or open source, or through our uh, development pipeline, the CI pipeline, ensuring that you know, we have a constant scanning to mitigate those. 
So you know, having that as part of your engine, as part of the automation, helps you to ensure that you know there'll be one or two exceptions that you're react to, but you're not constantly reacting to it. Um, and then, in, you know, specifically, when I look at cloud, right? And so you know, Visa, we are we are the largest private cloud and payment industry, uh, and uh, you know, we you know we don't rely as much on the public clouds, but I can say that the major uh, concern is the transparency, the transparency from the public uh, public cloud vendors. Uh, but you know, we have had uh, we, you know as we engage with those vendors, you know, we do see that. Uh, the vendors are improving the maturity. Um, you know, they are um, adding a lot of features to ensure that you can integrate that with your workloads. Uh, but you know, my approach, has, our approach has always been to ensure that we have a security first within our own private cloud, and then where it matters, we augment. Uh, you know, for certain use cases. Mm -hmm. One quick question for everyone. You've talked about the very complicated structure you have with your vendors in general, and sometimes there is the bully pulpit, right? You can do that through your contracts and mandating that. Did you find any time in the last, let's just say three to five years, where maybe vendors push back more and all of a sudden they realize the risks and they're more willing to work with you on this? Like, was there a culture in your vendor community that you saw change? I can go, go first. So you know, the, one of the things I you know when I when we we work with many vendors in the industry, right, and for different reasons, and the thing is, once we come up with the requirements, they understand that if it's good for a technology, you know, financial company like Visa, they can actually raise the bar, not just for Visa but for the entire ecosystem, right. So if you want to set the bar such a way that all of us can benefit, right, that's number one. So uh, we have in the past years, you know, we have had. We increasingly tighten the requirements uh, for the vendors, uh, so we can understand their posture. Uh, I know it's still you know a long way to go, right? To understand exactly where, you know, where they are. Um, you know, if you look back on solar winds, what happened to solar winds, right? I mean, the entire process was, you know, of course, uh, not visible to the customers, but now with some of the secure by design uh, requirements and ensuring that we can hold our vendors accountable. There's going to be a lot more. There's a lot more appetite uh, to share things like S bomb, uh, share about the practices, uh, including uh, the right to test and audit in real time. Okay, so a lot of these are, you know, coming together. Uh, so hence, I would say that the there's, even though the pushback had happened a while back, now I think a lot of the vendors and partners are coming to terms that it's you know something that they should do inherently, mm. right? And that helps not just for not just my company but the entire ecosystem. Yes, I agree. I think, again, it's, it's that evolution, right? So if you're working with a small company that's not used to that high bar, it does take a little bit of an adjustment. They have to go back and figure out, right, internally, how do they comply? But then to Supero's point, they know that if they raise the bar, that could be a selling point to other potential customers as well. Um, and I think the other component, too, Right, it's around how large of a customer you are when you're dealing with that third party. Now, if you're one of us where you have the transaction volume and the brand, you can push your vendors a bit more than the smaller players or those that don't have as higher spend. So in those cases, you have to provide a lot more uh, education and persuasion um, than, than typical, but I would say that's pretty important. Yeah. I'd like to think that some of the work we've done with outreach to the government agencies like Treasury and the National Cyber Director have had some impact in moving vendors this way. Um, we've done a lot of good work over the past couple of years meeting with uh, Treasury and National Cyber Director and other elected officials to, to explain our, our needs and why we're trying to get certain providers to do things a bit differently. And I think that's a really important point. That has been one of the external sort of policy priorities that we've had as an ATPC Cyber Council to go in and actually spend time to dig into some of these issues. As Rick talked about with Treasury, Homeland Security, the National Cyber Director. I mean, we worked as the ATPC with Treasury when they were doing some mapping of the payments industry into the larger banking industry from a global perspective. And I think as we've also demonstrated to them, 
our, our team and our people and our companies are working with smaller vendors, right? You've got those mom and pop vendors you've had for forever and you don't want you know, to completely remove them. The goal is to get them where they need to go. The other piece I think that's really important that, that we just heard is the, the ability to bring everybody together to uh, a rising tide does lift all boats. Cybersecurity and security is becoming a business differentiator. Right, if they're understanding when they're talking to our folks that if they're doing these things, they can actually sell that as a marketing perspective, that's good for everybody. But we do have one aspect of the supply chain that's very tough even sometimes for us. And when we talk about cloud providers, you know, that, that has been a difficult issue, not just for us, but certainly for all industries. Um, there has been this focus by Treasury and a number of other agencies to look at cloud and sort of that market monopoly. But it's not automatic that even our folks, as big as we are, uh, can really push forward on some of those mandates. Now, we have seen in the news a lot of issues around cloud providers. We've seen the Department of Homeland Security with a cyber safety review board talking about some systemic culture failures from some large tech companies and cloud. But I think for us, you know, let's talk a little bit about how you view cloud, how you deal with the vendors. And obviously, since we are so heavily regulated, we have to have these protections in the cloud, and that's not something that is a normal product offering. So maybe talk about the changes you've seen, especially post the Microsoft Exchange issues, SolarWinds, and how you've been able to deal with that. Well, I think the important thing is to, to take an honest look at your organization. Um, lots of people talk about going cloud native. We realize that we're always gonna be hybrid. We just can't move everything into the cloud. So at that point, we need posture management for the cloud with the ability to automatically quarantine when the configuration drifts out of the approved um, standard. That's a very big and, and important piece that will prevent some of this access to cloud-based uh, objects. If you can quarantine it as soon as it drifts, and our next step is auto-remediation, bringing it back to that baseline config, um, those capabilities are, are game changers for managing your cloud environment. Um, the eye-opening part for us was when we met with the Treasury Department, we were talking about um, after another trade association, financial services posted a, a white paper about the cloud. Um, they had the perception that large companies like Fiserv can negotiate with the providers and Treasury said, we're the government, we can't even negotiate with them. So I think that perception being understood widely is, is also important that, you know, we've got to change the behavior there. We've got to get them to be more accommodating. Um, but for the past couple of years, they haven't been. Hopefully things change in the near future now. Yep. Others? So I guess I'll add on um, to Rick's point. Those are definitely uh, challenges that we all deal with. And then in terms of like protection, I would say a lot of these things you can apply, right? Security principles uh, and controls in your on-prem or traditional environment to the cloud. You can overlay it with some additional protection, but it's not rocket science, right? It's again, knowing who's getting access is there exposure, doing the hygiene of vulnerability management, et cetera. Um, but again, it is, it is a challenge because you're dealing with very large monopolies um, and there, there's, um, you know, if there's additional feature and function, they wanna charge for it. So again, getting us all together to push for some of those foundational controls that you would expect regardless. Yeah, super. Yeah, and Norma, I'm glad you mentioned that uh, cyber is a differentiator, right? I mean, it's a big differentiator for selling your services and earning the trust of the consumers. And cloud is, is no different, right? You have to make sure that security is a differentiator when, you, when it comes to adopting a cloud. I'm sure many of you are looking at multi-cloud. Uh, you know, obviously, we, you know, we want to ensure that you have the right cloud for the right use cases. Um, so for a couple of things I can, I can share with you. One is ensuring that there's a clear understanding in, in terms of posture, right? Like I know we have a baseline of our security posture and how does our posture compare to the cloud, right? And we, we set a very clear principle. When we move workloads to the cloud, the security posture in the cloud should be equal or better than on-prem, right, period. So that, that's the basic principle we established. So how do we do that, right? So we set up a framework. Uh, the framework has many controls. So when we take workloads to the cloud, we need to understand how is their posture, because not all clouds are equal when it comes to cyber posture. So we need to understand what, the, what are they offering in terms of the uh, in, inbuilt services for patch management, uh, confidential computing, 
how are you ensuring that your data is going to uh, be protected, addressed in transit and use? Uh, how do you make sure the insider threat is managed, uh, given the fact that there will be risks concentrated in one place in some cases? Uh, so we look at, you know, from that lens, right? And again, we are very, very data-driven. Uh, you know, we want to ensure that we understand how the posture compares with on-prem. And then we also use zero trust architecture. Zero trust architecture, I know is a buzzword, but we have taken that principle to extend our on-prem into the cloud. So we can say when, you know, in a, in a model like Rick, you said, hybrid, hybrid cloud may be the right, you know, use, right way to approach the, the cloud computing. And in that model, how does that zero trust uh, transcend into your on-prem? Uh, so that's, that's been our experience so far. And I, like I said, you know, we believe that uh, there are still more opportunities in the cloud to improve the posture, uh, and it's uh, it's collectively amongst us to ensure that we hold them accountable. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I, I think your point too, saying that um, the cloud should be equal or better, equal or more secure than on-prem, and I still think we have a lot of medium-sized businesses, or certainly small, who don't understand that. They think putting everything in the cloud is offloading 100% of their cybersecurity risk. They don't understand that there aren't basic, necessarily basic cybersecurity requirements on cloud providers. And we've seen that change, I think, from at least the, the in the United States and in the EU, where the EU is already categorized cloud as part of the IT infrastructure and is essential services. We've seen in the United States just the other day with the White House issuing a new national security memorandum, NSM 22, you should all know that, you're gonna memorize that, you know, where basically reminded people that cloud is in IT. IT is a critical infrastructure sector and there is the requirement now to have minimum security standards across all and hopefully, you know, that will help us. And obviously something that we're gonna be working on in the Cyber Council. You know, one other piece I want to talk about in the supply chain, and then we're going to we'll move on to a different topic, is the issue of using open source software. We've got open source. We, now we have a debate over who owns the liability for using open source, right? There's great innovation and creativity in the open source community, but I, I see all this nodding. I'm just going to, let's run down the panel. How do you think about these issues? You know, what do you worry about? What do you like? Well, I think the, the main concern is if the government puts liability on the development of that open source, the developers walk away and abandon that project, and then whatever vulnerabilities exist continue to exist. And when it's ubiquitous, like Log4j or Spring for Shell or all those, you know, there's a lot of work to move that to a newer version or a completely different architecture. So, so that's probably our primary concern, that liability placement is, is appropriate. Um, I don't know that putting liability on those that use it is the right answer either. So that's a, that's a difficult question. Yeah, Clarissa? Yeah, and I guess with the, some of the recent um, event as well, it kind of challenges your, um, some of the premise, right? Which is how do you ensure that there's nothing malicious or any backdoor that's been inserted? Um, and we have seen, right, based on recent news events as well, that those operations are very stealth and takes multiple years. Um, and so part of that is, is, again, doing, I always call it doing the basics, right? Validating uh, the components that you're integrating into your products and continuous monitoring uh, and having threat intelligence out there as well, um, just to identify potential risk. But it is, it is a, a very complex um, area and I anticipate it's gonna continue um, as the new cycle, uh, uh, kind of pans through that there's other um, backdoor potentially for other open source components out there that have not been identified yet. So that's something that I'm extremely worried about as well. Mm -hmm. Super? Yeah, I mean, similar to Clarissa, you know, she was alluding to the incident that happened a few weeks back. Uh, I think as a, uh, you know, most of us in, in this room are probably have a very good point of view on your vendors, right? And your security, you know, what vendor technology you're sourcing and their, posture. Um, I think open source for the last few years has been, been under, under the radar. The developers are being given the freedom to innovate, right? And there's a lot more um, open source that made it in, into the stack. So it's high time we start categorizing open source into the risk categories, right? Because not, again, we are, there's very long tail in open source. 
we know for a fact that the, when we uh, open source is backed by a vendor, we can hold the vendor accountable. Mm -hmm. Uh, when the open source is backed by community, of course, community is great, right? Because you know we have embraced Apache. You know we ourselves are doing this contribution to the source to the open source. So when you go to the communities, you need to make sure that there is the right level of governance, uh, and they are able to respond to pat, to uh, to CVEs. What we have seen is that there are quite a few open source components um, don't have patches, right? I mean we expect you know when there is a zero day or when there's a vulnerability discovered, by, that's a great part of the open source, right? You can also get multiple eyes to look at the open source and understand what are the vulnerabilities are in that particular code. And But if, you, if the community cannot respond to the vulnerability in time, right? Because every company, we all, we all have a very good governance approach to make sure we respond to these issues in the, in the right time frame. And if you don't have that, then you are, you know, you, you are left high and dry. Uh, so we have been looking at how do we ensure we can uh, look at the risk categories, including, uh, you know, when we say end of life, right? Because most companies don't have the idea of what does end of life mean for open source, right? Because, you know, community could have been there for many years. So this will help to ensure that, you know, you can look at it from a risk lens and understand, you know, what is the risk posture based on how the open source has been consumed. You know, I'll just say one piece on this. I think what we what we need in the ecosystem, we don't want to stifle the innovation of the open source developers, right? They're doing amazing and innovative things and they've been doing that for years. Now if we can add some secure, you know, cybersecurity in that front end, it, you know, the point is they're they're building software and putting it out in the wild and then people decide what they're gonna do with it, right? That liability shift, you know, appears to be moving towards those who use open source, right, and then in a product or a service. I think the harder part is making sure that we don't frighten away the developers, that we don't maybe overreach on where the liability goes. And I think that messy middle, that at least the US government, and certainly we're seeing governments around the world are trying to talk about how do you pull this together in a cohesive regime? I don't think we're gonna see the US rushing to regulate about these issues, but this is a really important dialogue. I know ATPC Cyber Council is gonna engage in with the White House and others, and I do want everyone in the audience to think through how do we create the structure that makes sense, right? We don't wanna kill it. Um, I'm gonna shift off of some of these issues as joyful as supply chain and, <laughs> and uh, some of the vendor management is and talk about a little bit overused in the phrase information sharing. But what we did see in the in NSM 22 is this focus and push by the White House to the intelligence community to spend more time working with the private sector. Now that doesn't mean giving away sources and methods. This has been an issue of contention for the last hundred thousand years since man started walking on Earth. You know, but as we think about this industry, we spend a lot of time sharing with each other. I think we have a better sense of maybe some of the intel information that we're looking for. And so just you know, quick round on what are the top two things that, we, that you'd really like to see come out of some of these processes with the White House and working more collaboratively together? You know, when we met with Chris Inglis, when he was the National Cyber Director, he had mentioned that a lot of times we think the government has more information than, than they do, which may or may not be a valid point. Uh, I'm undecided on that. But when they do share things with us, you know, having a temporal um, piece to it that look for these indicators during this time frame um, because they just share things that may have been active for a very long time and we may have seen them in our, our attack surface management in the past doing things different than seen in a recent attack. So what's the time frame we're looking for this specific threat that you're sharing is, is important to us. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I will say uh, we'll all agree that the bad actor actually have a better threat intelligence sharing. Mm -hmm. Uh, mechanism than um, than the defender, so that's pretty unfortunate. So we kind of rely a lot on each other's and our network to get some of that intelligence. But to Rick's point, um, having near real time will definitely help in strengthening the the ecosystems uh, and making sure that we're resilient to those attacks. But I mean, it's a challenge, right? We've been talking about this for how many years now? And I don't think we've gotten any better since then. Um, so I think the most effective thing is just that sharing among each other as much as possible. 
Yeah, well said. Uh, so, you know, it, it's definitely we need to have a level playing, level playing field for all of us, right? The threat intel should be democratized to, you know, not just the, the big folks, but also for the, the, the smaller folks, the merchants, the smaller payment uh, processors and so forth. And, you know, I know that uh, the, the intel sharing has been happening in different forums. Uh, for example, you know, we use quite a bit of uh, private threat intel. We have a partnership with CISA, DHS, with, um, you know, the UK, many other governments throughout the world. And I think there's opportunity for us to, you know, bring that together from a private consortium standpoint, right? Like at the ATPC Council here, uh, as much as we are together to share this, now how do we get that to the folks uh, who may not have the same level of uh, investment? Uh, and uh, I think uh, f one of the things I would say is AI will play a big role. Uh, as you know, Clarissa was saying that bad guys are rushing to use AI uh, to you know use it to their advantage. So how do you really change your approach to a threat intel-led defense? Right. That's that's how we are looking at. The threat intel is going to be the differentiator. How fast you get the threat intel, how fast you react to that, and be able to respond to a particular situation. So in that respect, I believe there are some good opportunities in AI to look at how we can bring those collective intelligence and be able to democratize that to, to, to the entire planet. I, I think the one other thing I would like to see is commonality in naming these threat actors and not needing the Rosetta Stone to map from one vendor to another to the government. That's a yeah. great point. Absolutely. Super, you touched on one issue I want to go through for a few more minutes, and we'll leave five minutes for questions. Um, so uh, make sure we get, we're able to do that. When we talk about artificial intelligence, so AI is you know the new buzzword. It, for a lot of people, people have been saying we've been using AI for forever. It's really probably more machine learning, depending on you know where you sit in the industry. Um, I think it's really important for the universe to understand the differences between machine learning and AI, right? What does a fully sentient AI system look like? What are those risks? What's that timeline? And for us in the ATPC Cyber Council, as we start to look at these issues, we're looking at it from the offensive tool that we can use to better protect ourselves, right? It is the AI and quantum race. If theirs is better than ours, they're gonna break all of ours very quickly and we're gonna have to start all over again. And we're seeing that race, right, with other nation states, Russia, China, and what have you. But it's also helping us on a, from a defensive perspective. Um, so let's, let's just talk a little bit about where we think whether it's from your corporate perspective, you think AI fits machine learning versus AI fits now, and certainly Treasury and some of our regulators and others are worried about um, the very basics, which is important. Garbage in, garbage out. If you are training a model you know, with data that you haven't validated or authenticated, if you don't understand how that model is gonna make decisions, and when we talk about risks in code, open source and otherwise, I, it's not like you're gonna unwind that in 30 seconds when there's a problem. So I've just thrown 50 different issues out for everybody to, to tag off of. So who wants to start? I'll start. I mean, AI is pretty much what they call a dual use technology, right? It can be used for good, can be used for evil. When we were on Capitol Hill last, I mentioned to some of the elected officials that you know, if you do any legislation around AI, don't affect the good things that are helping the security tools that we use that may be writing automated rules for web app firewalls faster than a human can. Right? So there's definitely a space for that. Um, when it comes to generative AI, we've got an internal version that we're running right now, but we've also got policies and standards that it's not going to make any decision for any financial instrument. It's got to be reviewed by a human. right? The, the, issue with hallucinations and potential bias and, and what it interprets from the training model is, is still problematic in many instances. Yeah. So, um, you know, these are, we've been using AI for the last 30 years. Uh, last year, we protected our customers from $40 billion in fraud using AI. So, you know, AI is not new to us, but what's new is Gen AI, right? What we saw from the last uh, 18 months uh, since the advent of ChatGPT. So if I had to look at it from the lens of the good guys, uh, AI has immense opportunity, right? And specifically around how we can enable the defenders, the you know the, the security operations center, who are operating 24 by 7, you know, giving them the information in the fingertips. So there's a lot of opportunity there. Uh, you know, we have, and again, if you look at from a predictive AI, which is uh, normally alluded as machine learning, 
uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities also there for us to look at anomalies, right? How do you think about a lateral movement? Uh, how do you look at the needle in the needle stack? So that is an area that you know most of the companies are been investing in, uh, and with the with the Gen AI, you know, we'll see a lot more focus on how do you you know secure mm. code while you know the code is being developed. How do you ensure that you know you can contain and auto contain within the time, right? You know, in real time. So there's a lot more things to look forward to. I know we cannot walk away from RSA this this year without talking <laughs> about AI. Right. And the the one thing I think that we're paying close attention to is Meta releasing Llama three publicly with the option to not download the safeguards is very interesting. So I don't know what people are gonna do with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I would say that, uh, I think the key aspect, I think Rick, you touched on is that to ensure there's a very strong governance around it, right? Mm -hmm. So the responsible AI includes the fairness of the model, uh, uh, including the concept of red teaming, making sure that the models are tested and validated so there's no biases, hallucination, attacks like injection attacks, right? All of these will help ensure there's a very strong risk model, risk management around the AI models. Yeah, 100%. You know, I keep saying to people, well, I don't know why we're, we would rush into AI and not think through all of these issues since we rushed into every other tech product and are trying to bolt security on after the fact, right? So let's maybe we should learn from those lessons and do this part the right way. All right, we are actually, we have five minutes left, so we're gonna take some questions. If anyone would like to go to the mic, we are happy to run through some issues. If you just actually tell us your name and organization before your question, that'd be very helpful. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Chris Weissobel from Veracode, and I'm just interested in how AI is impacting your whole software development process. We haven't really applied AI to the, the SDLC yet. Um, you know, it's, it's one of the things that we're looking at, but um, uh, we've got a couple of, of pilots running right now. Like there's, there's a couple of firms that do code completion, and I don't necessarily view AI-assisted software development any different than a developer searching the internet, going to GitHub, and grabbing a snippet of code that does X, right? So, you know, as long as there's some validation of it and testing after the fact that it's, it's been developed via AI, I think we're in an okay spot there. Um, we just haven't applied it fully yet. It's in a pilot um, in a couple of areas. Anybody else? Similarly, we're also piloting it, but also talking about governance and, and control that Supra talked about. We're pretty diligent about defining some of those use cases um, and then having cross-functional governance team from legal and compliance, security, et cetera, enterprise architecture to make sure some of those principles are outlined out and what those controls are as you apply it um, before it gets to a broader adoption. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we have, uh, again, we have been uh, piloting uh, co-pilots, uh, so to speak, uh, and, uh, you know, the results are very promising for developers, right? There's a lot of excitement around uh, improving developer productivity by 40, 50 percent. Uh, I think the opportunity for us is, from a, from a cyber standpoint, is that you can integrate a lot of the AI into the into the pipeline, meaning like, you know, you can have, you know, in, in, uh, in the process itself, recommend remediation. For example, uh, you know, average time taken for a, for a particular issue to be fixed is about eight hours, just average time. So we believe we can compress that much, much shorter uh, by providing a recommendation to fix, auto patch, all of that will be, will be part of our equation. So I'm looking forward to, you know, embracing AI in a way that we can not only improve developer productivity, but we can also scale the AppSec team as the number of lines of code increase. Excellent, go ahead. Bushra Shahid, uh, Wells Fargo Bank. So quick question regarding, so AI is really heavily dependent on the data that's available, right, in the environment. So we have, from a historic data perspective, like, do you see any challenges? Like, for example, you know, we do see challenges when in terms of looking at hiring trends, like how discriminated we were, like, several years back, right? We still are, maybe. But we had a ton of that data, which wasn't, you know, which we might not want to make those decisions based on where we were like 50 years back. So how are you kind of handling those problems where the data is not as accurate as you would like it to be to make good decisions out of it? So, so we have an AI steering committee that I sit on with uh, several of my, my colleagues. And you've got to present your use case, the data you use. Um, Sometimes that'll go to the data use and ethics committee for validation that it's okay to use that type of data. 
I think the, the case that you present here is probably good from a retroactive, let's look back, but let's not make decisions going forward based upon that, right? So it, it could be informative, but I wouldn't give it the ability to make decisions um, for anything like that. Else? Yeah, I would say, uh, again, echoing what Rick said, having a strong governance process is important, as well as understanding the data, right? Ultimately, the, the models are trained on the data. So if you have garbage in, garbage out, right? So, so a lot of the principles are going to be around testing, right? Ensuring that you have a strong validation of the model, right? The data biases, you know, are you seeing the biases due to the way the data has been trained? And uh, as I mentioned earlier, having a red team kind of thinking to think about all, you know, the different kind of test cases. Uh, it's a new area that companies are building muscle around, and it's very important to ensure that you have a governance along with them technology controls so you can have a safe and secure onboarding. Thank you. Thank you for that. Well, you know what? I know we're at time, but we really appreciate you all spending time with us today. What we wanted to accomplish is really to make sure that you understand really the critical role that the payments industry plays in general, right? We talk about the payment rails, we talk about that connective tissue, and the fact that we could have such, a, I think, an important and amazing conversation with the practitioners, right? This is about being practical and pragmatic as we're running a business, we're talking about new products and services, and this is one of the many fun things about the Cyber Council uh, that we get to do together. So th please uh, give a warm thanks uh, to our panelists for the conversation, and thank you all for joining us here today. Have a great hour. Today. And please complete the survey. Oh, and good point. Please complete the survey. Of course, we'd really like you to say nice things about our panel, uh, but thank you again for coming. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you all.